Hello everyone, welcome to this webinar uh, on uh, children in terrorist organizations. Uh, my name is Tori Bergo, I'm Director for Center for Research on Extremism at the University of Oslo and also uh, coordinating the consortium. Um, uh, and we have today uh, two good uh, leading scholars in the field. Um, Mia uh, Bloom is um, at the, the uh, Georgia State University. Uh, she has been uh, one of the leading researchers in the field of children in terrorist organizations. She has also published extensively in, on a number, number of related issues like um, uh, on women and terrorism, on suicide terrorists, and now uh, this book, uh, Small Arms, Children and Terror. And there is another one coming out now soon on, on women and jihad. Um, um, this topic uh, we are going to cover now is, is uh, on, um, on how terrorist organizations like ISIS, Hamas and Taliban are exploiting children for their terrorist purposes and how they are also brainwashing children to um, adopt very extremist ideologies. And uh, a burning issue in many countries, uh, in Europe in particular, is how to deal with this. Should we bring these children back before they are totally destroyed by these terrorist organizations? And as you know, this is a hot issue in Norway as well. To comment on, uh, on uh, Mia's contribution, she will now speak for uh, 30, 40 minutes. Uh, we have Elizabeth Harness. Uh, at, um, uh, who, who is working at, uh, at the R RVTS West uh, Resource Center for Violence, Traumatic Stress and Suicide Prevention uh, in Bergen. She's also working very, has uh, been working a lot on, on uh, uh, prevention of radicalization, violent extremism, and also one of those who have worked with children who have uh, been in, in uh, these areas controlled by ISIS and, and similar groups. Uh, we have unfortunately some uh, some password problems with Elizabeth, so we hope she will be able to join us uh, during Mia's. Uh, fortunate, I hope so she will be able to see Mia's contribution because we have some problems to get her in now. Um, so um, Mia, uh, the floor is yours, and please uh, tell us uh, what uh, about your research on this topic. Well, thank you, Tori. It's nice to be here uh, virtually, although, as you know, I'm very fond of, of Norway, so I wish I could be there in person. And uh, I know Tori for a very, very long time, almost two decades, and one of my happiest memories has nothing to do with terrorism. We went to go tour the Anheuser-Busch plant uh, because Tori is a, an award-winning beer maker, and so we went to Anheuser-Busch in St. Louis during a conference and we were there with the horses and he was telling them about it, their beer and they thought, I can't believe on the tour is someone who has won all these awards. So I have very happy memories with Tori. Um, I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about the research. I also want to tell you a little bit about the methodology because I think it's very important that when we're doing research on a subject, we have not just one person researching the subject. So one of the things in as a political scientist, it's very important that we're able to reproduce and validate the findings. So it's also, uh, as I explained to you how I did it, uh, we are working towards making the data that I have collected uh, in a data bank that will be open and available to anyone who is working on these subjects. So that is one of the projects. So I'm gonna talk to you about children as the target for recruitment. I will never use the word uh, child terrorist. I will explain in the Q&A more if you want to know why, but I think we need to understand that these are children who in many ways, uh, even if they participate in violence, they're not responsible for their participation because they're children. But also it's not just the children who participated in violence. We also have other layers of the children who were made to witness violence the children who participated in some capacity in violence, and then also children who violence was done to them. And so we really do have to, you know, as I give you my bluff, my bottom line up front, as countries like Norway are considering whether to repatriate the women and children, uh, my first answer, I'm going to tell you it's yes, and hopefully this presentation will convince you why I think so. Now, this is why I have to do this. I know who I am, and Tori just gave me a lovely introduction. But because the research is funded by the Department of Defense, 
Um, what happens is I need to give you a disclaimer that I, I don't represent the US government or the Department of Defense or the Minerva Research Initiative or the Department of the Navy. And this is very important because if I, if I say something wrong, it's not the Navy's fault, it's my fault. And this gives you a, a little bit of an idea of the different funding sources I've had, my methodology, but also uh, I'm very happy to announce that uh, yesterday, uh, Georgia State University uh, received a, a brand new award to study weaponized conspiracies. So I'm very excited to be able to take my research in a different direction. And here are the books, some of the books that uh, Tori mentioned. Uh, the new book that's coming out before Women in Global Jihad is called Pastels and Pedophiles. It's the first book for the new project, looking at the way in which QAnon has uh, become such a phenomenon and, and, and many people consider it very dangerous. Uh, Sofia Moskalenko and I actually consider that it's more dangerous to the people than it is as a future terrorism threat, but we explain the whole thing in the book and the book is going to be out in June. And uh, what's very ple like what I'm very happy about is it's the first book about QAnon that's not trying to convert you to QAnon. So it will be the first book on the subject. All right. So what are we talking about? I think from a theoretical uh, perspective, I like to give you what are some of the findings uh, before getting into the background and the methodology and a narrative. Here are the findings. International relations theory has really done a very poor job of understanding the role of children in any of these movements. And the reason has to do, as it was very succinctly explained to me uh, by uh, my IR professors, is that uh, in IR, you know, we have the three levels of analysis and children are not man, state or war. They don't vote. They're not officially conscripted and they're not policymakers. So like there's no way to have included children in any of the research to date. It's only more recently that we see children increasingly having a role in civil wars, interstate wars and intrastate wars that we have had to uh, enter into a conversation or I think the word, I think you guys use the term interrogate the role of children. Now, when I was first approaching this and I started the project a long time ago, it took a very, very long time for this book to come out. And I'm going to tell you why a little bit after was that um, a lot of people were saying, well, you know, children are not in IR, but they are in economics. OK, what what do we see in economics? Well, there are in labor economics. There's a subset of the literature called child labor economics. And the reason that that is there is because we have a lot of places around the world in which children are engaged in you know, economic activity while they are still children. And the way it's looked at in economic terms is whether the children are a substitute or a complementary good. And I want to explain what I mean by good because it's not good, but as in an economic term, as in goods. Now, a substitute good is I can't find anyone to work for me, so I'm going to have a child. Or in the case of some of these movements, uh, there's no adults that want to join us, so we're going to take children. Or the, the adults have died, we're going to substitute them with children. But what economic labor um, findings have been in terms of in economics has been that they mostly have a complementary role. And what does a complementary role mean? If you guys are in Oslo and you go to buy a rug, any rug, the first thing that's going to happen is they're going to flip over the rug and they're going to show you on the back side knots per inch. And in other words, the more knots, the better. In other words, a higher quality rug, more expensive, etc. So we very often see because children have little fingers and they can make smaller knots than, you know, my sausage hands, that what happens is that children are employed in rug industries around the world, India and Pakistan and Egypt and everywhere where they make rugs, children are making the rugs. So in other words, the children have something the adults don't have. It's not that there's an absence of adults and we need children. It's that the children have a special skill and this special skill in this case is small hands. And maybe that was what was um, underpinning this inquiry are children being used in a substitute model or a complementary fashion? Do the children have something that the adults don't have? For example, they can do the elements of surprise. What is this child doing here? Or they look innocent 
or they have small bodies that they can get through tunnels, let's say for Hamas. So this is what uh, the theoretical motivation of looking at the role of children. So what did I find? It's a little bit unsatisfying because it's not one or the other. <laughs> it depends on the conflict. And so it can be one or the other or combinations. And what does it depend on? The ideology of the conflict. A lot of terrorist organizations absolutely refuse to have children. They only recruit uh, over the age of consent. So in many countries, it's 17 or 18. They will only recruit adults. And the way they do so is where they recruit. They recruit at university. And the presumption is someone in university is an adult. The structural conditions of the conflict are very important. And what do I mean by structural conditions? And this is something you often hear. Well, it's about the occupation or it's about uh, economic inequalities. It's about racism. OK, those are structural conditions that impact everybody. But what we know is that not every child ends up in one of these terrorist groups. We also know that the structural conditions for adults fails to account for things like agency. And I'm going to return to that at the end of the talk. But the other conditions that we do have to take into account is what are the roles of teachers, and educators, religious leaders, uh, coaches? In other words, people who have access to children. What is their role? The other thing that I was curious about is, was there a temporal stage of a conflict? For example, maybe you didn't use children at the beginning, but you used it at the end. And that would imply that it was a substitute. Or maybe you use children at specific times, but it was really important that we looked at variation. Finally, it's absolutely going to be a substitute good if there's a failure to mobilize the adults. And so much in the way that I've talked about women, that groups use women in order to goad men, I think that some of these groups use children in ways to encourage or goad the men to step up because there are these notions of manliness and I think they call it murwa, like this idea of, we would now call it toxic masculinity, but that this notion of manliness being challenged forces someone to get involved. And then finally, the nature of targeting is very important. When, you know, most terrorist groups don't start out by killing civilians. Many terrorist groups start out by killing or attacking a hard target, a hard target like a military base or a police station, something where people can shoot back. But when many of these terrorist groups move from a hard target to a soft target, a soft target to kill civilians, that's when children and women began to blend in better. So I'm going to show you where do we get the data and uh, Reike was close, uh, very, very kind enough to blur the faces because I don't need you to see the faces to explain how the data was um, collected. What happened was we had uh, access to ISIS Telegram and ISIS was posting images of, of children uh, in their about to die. And what about to die images, and there is a well-known literature on about to die images, or also it's called last will and testament video. What we were able to get, and me and my research team, was that we could see in the red, it says Ajel, which is breaking news. And then in the blue, it tells you what media point uploaded it. So we know where it happened. But in the white writing, it tells us a little bit something about, you know, what this person did. So for example, in the first upper right, you see Abu Khattab al-Sinjari. So we know actually uh, right away, al-Sinjari, this is a Yazidi child. And we see from the writing, was he an Ingamasi? Was he like a guerrilla fighter? Was he a suicide bomber, an istishhadi? Was he, like, what did he do? So this is where again, and I've sort of been saying this for a few years now, Doing this research solely in translation, you are going to lose any of the nuance because in English, murabit and istishhadi and mujahid and all of those, those are martyr, but it doesn't tell you what kind of martyr. So when we did this and we translated, there's a Hijri date, we translated it into the Gregorian date. Now we had the ability to place where the child was from, where the child you know had this operation this militant operation usually some sort of martyrdom quote unquote operation what um 
We have some information about what was the nature of the operation, but we could also start gleaning additional information like how long between, you know, like of the training period, how long, for example, was Abu Khattab missing? Because of course, as a Yazidi child, he was captured in April of 2014. And then how long before he actually was uh, detonated or detonated his uh, improvised uh, explosive device. The other thing we were able to glean is what were some of the uh, jobs or the roles that the terrorist group gave to the children. And, you know, we had the whole range. So this is what I was able to do by separating it into a two by two matrix between support roles and combat roles. We had both informal and formal. And you see that the, the sector that has the most roles is formal combat. In other words, ISIS used children more in combat roles, either as a kind of guard or scout, artillery operator or, or suicide bomber, all of these things, um, more than any other category. I don't know if, did I lose, did I lose my PowerPoint or you guys still see it? Okay, perfect. I was just drinking something. Now, just in Gamasi, which was the word that I used before, that's a guerrilla fighter. What was very interesting, and now I'm going to come to some of this complementary role was that in many of the instances in which children were Ingamasi, guerrilla fighters, they were embedded into a unit that was mixed with adults and children. And from some of the narratives, the children went in first. And I think that just the split second where the people who are looking at this child are thinking, who is this person? Why is there a child here? That moment of delay, the second of hesitation, gives the group a comparative advantage because the next group comes in with the adults and they're shooting and eventually they blow up. And so I think that, you know, different from what we've seen in Coney and some of the child soldier literature coming out of Latin America, Asia and Africa, these were not dedicated children units. For the most part, what we saw was children embedded within. But we also saw, you know, the different roles. They taught children to drive just for the purpose of being a car bomber. And, you know, we would look very in a very detailed fashion at the child, at the children that are behind the wheel. Is it an automatic? Is it a stick shift? Uh, is the child also wearing a suicide uh, belt, like a IED, improvised explosive device? Or are they wearing a uniform? We coded everything for this database. One of the things that we found is that ISIS was uh, talent scouting, and, and I've written on talent scouting, it's something that ISIS did, as well as even the Irish Republican Army. What talent scouting means is that the terrorist organization is looking for skill sets, and so that they are able to evaluate each individual applicant. And of course, this draws a lot from Jake Shapiro's work, but this is something Al Qaeda did. You know, you actually had a job form and you had to fill out, you know, can you fly a plane and do you speak foreign languages? One of the things that ISIS was doing is they would identify children who were especially articulate, charming, good looking, and they would put them on the Dawa caravan. And the Dawa caravan was basically to recruit. The reason that this is important is, first of all, just because ISIS captured a city, it didn't mean everybody automatically joined ISIS. They had to be convinced. And one of the ways in which they were convinced was by a child like this, who was standing up and he's holding the microphone. And you know, he's shaming publicly the men. Look, I'm a kid and I'm willing to fight for the Islamic State. What are you willing to do? And this is what I talked about in my work starting in 2005 about women, but then definitely in Bombshell. The idea that using these unusual operatives doesn't just allow a terrorist group to tap into a larger network of potential operatives, but also it does have this role of shaming men. The exploitation of children, 100%, this is where the use of children in these movements has been both exploitative and very damaging. And what do I mean by this is that it's not to say that groups haven't used children in the past. Some have. And we know that there was a serious problem of child soldiers in the 1990s, which is one of the reasons why Gabriela Machel produced a report um, that in, I think, 1996 for the UN, 
It basically said there were all these countries who were employing children under the age of 18 in roles, everything from support to the front line, and it really had to stop. And so if states or non-state actors were using children, they started to do so very quietly or they stopped using children altogether. ISIS brings the children to front and center. ISIS has been one of the only groups to brag about the use of children. And so this is where it's interesting. So wh when did I get this? So this is July 2014. So early on in the process, who was at the time, he's no longer alive. At the time, he was a well-known Australian jihadi who had been previously arrested. He was on the radar. He, he took or stole his brother's passport and took all of his kids to Syria, posted a picture of his son at the time, was eight years old, holding up a severed head. And what happens is, as you would expect, the story went viral. It went from just Twitter to Facebook and then to live media, to like um, every news station, not just in Australia, but even the United States to CNN and then also, you know, newspapers. In May, two years later, in May 2016, um, we started to see the use of a group of children that they were mostly foreign children. Now, I mentioned the talent scouting, and what happened was ISIS was making distinctions between the children who were, for lack of a better term, single use. In other words, they found them expendable versus the children that they found maybe were very valuable to them. And in many cases, the children of the foreign fighters, they found valuable. So they put together this video called 100%. And for those of you who speak French, it translated directly, it means blood for blood. But if you say it quickly, it's like, sounds like 100% perfect. And I remember thinking at the time, that is, that's more clever than any of the titles of my books. Because, you know, I really appreciate a good pun, as you can tell from the titles of my books. And I found out it was stolen from a Moroccan rapper. So, again, these children were not used once. They were shown in the video, and then a few months later, the exact same children in the same lineup are used executing Kurdish prisoners. Now, I didn't, Yurike uh, was kind enough to blur the faces, but I didn't put in the countries where they're from so that the first one is Egyptian and the second one is British and this, the third one is Tunisian and so on. They did that. They were trying to convey this almost united colors of Benetton ISIS, that you know, ISIS was a melting pot, you know, it was multi-ethnic, multi-racial, multi-everything, a utopian society in which children could come. And so this is where it's very interesting to see ISIS never used these children. Now, the second child who's British, like, for example, the child who was Kurdish, because they were in Western news, we were able to validate about 10% of the youth that were in the data set, not just, you know, believing ISIS, that ISIS says something and you take a terrorist group at its word, but we were able to double and triple check within Western and alternative media sources to um, absolutely make sure that these who were the, these, this is who the kids were and where they were from and their stories. So tracking children and propaganda became very interesting because you could find the same children over and over. And so you see, these are the two Sinjari brothers. We know that they're brothers because there were reports from the Yazidi community, but also the video that they made says, you know, we originally were devil worshippers and the only way into the light was to join the Islamic State and now it's our duty to be martyrs. And so again, this is a kind of brainwashing that is actually falls under the Genocide Convention as being, you know, uh, a war crime. But separately, you could also follow the children over the years as they grow up. And it's almost like uh, the... Um, there's a documentary movie by Linklater called uh, Childhood, and you're watching the same kids growing up over the years. And in the media, in the propaganda with ISIS, you could do that. And so you could track the same kids. So for example, uh, this is Abdullah. And you see in the first one, Abdullah, he's with his father. Yes, he's holding a gun, but he's in the background and he's in a group. And now Abdullah in the second one in 2014 in November, he's in the video Race Towards Good which was a propaganda film. And then by January 2015, 
they have another video where Abdullah is executing two alleged FSB spies. Abdullah would have been no more than 15 years old at the, in the last photo. So what we're seeing is Islamic State using the same children over and over again versus some of the children, mostly the Iraqi and Syrian children, that are used just the one time. When I talk about social ecology of children, one of the things that we looked at in for the project and that I looked at in the book was understanding the role of education. And this was very important because the role of education was not exclusively in ISIS. This is something you could look at terrorist groups around the world. And so you see, for example, here, you see Tank as uh, is Debeba. So D is for Debeba or B is for Bundakia. This idea that they're teaching their ABCs, where A is not for a Apple, but A is for AR-15. And this again, this imbuing every element of their education with military imagery in order to desensitize the child to war and to violence is something you could track. But that was not an invention of ISIS. When I was doing my field research for Bombshell in Northern Ireland, and I spent time at Linen Hall, they had a book a children's book that was used in some of the uh, pro IRA schools in the Catholic communities in Belfast that A is for Armalite. Armalite is the A in AR-15. And so you see it's the picture from the recruiting image of a woman in the skirt holding an automatic weapon. And it's not something that ISIS invented. It is something that we see from terrorist groups around the world. So understanding what children are taught becomes very important. Part of the project was to archive 40, a little bit over 40 textbooks in English and in Arabic, and to you know make those electronic copies accessible. And going through it, I will tell you, and I, I apologize for my dark sense of humor, uh, we could see in mathematics that you don't count apples and oranges. I can't believe they're counting uh, guns and tanks. But, and you see in the corner, this is from an actual, uh, it says in Tehan, it's an actual test that was captured. So it's not just hypothetical, it was even on the, they were tested on the material. But this one is my favorite, uh, favorite in a dark sense, that the way that the children in grade two learn to tell time is that they're using a clock, but that the clock is affixed to a bundle of dynamite. So this was an important early finding that every single group in Syria was using children on the front lines, not children as, um, as uh, civilian casualties. We're talking about children who are active. And ISIS at the outset is the black line. In other words, the red line was the Free Syrian Army. And this is where it's very important that although we know absolutely ISIS are the bad guys, every group in Syria, including the good guys, including the guys that were funded by the United States government, were using children on the front lines. So let's, let's go to the data. What were some of the hypotheses that we were able to prove? Which are some of the things that we haven't yet been able to prove? Well, certainly that there was, again, um, a very, not a sharp, but there was an increasing use of children over time, up until the second Mosul campaign, and then basically by around 2017, it drops off. But it drops off in Syria and Iraq, but it escalates significantly in some of the ISIS affiliates, let's say in Afghanistan. And so you have a lot more children in Afghanistan participating and also images of children, uh, as well as in places like Boko, with Boko Haram in Nigeria and you know uh, neighboring countries where Boko Haram operates. The other thing was, and again, this is just preliminary, that it does seem that in the aftermath of a battle loss, after within about a month or so of a battle loss, we start to see more children that are um, in these martyrdom last will and testaments. So it is possible that it was in fact um, motivated by replacing the lost adults. We have to really now, just as I have only a few more minutes left and I don't want to take up too much of my time. I think I only have five minutes left. Um, the issue of the children in the camps is very relevant. Um, I'm not going to show you this video because uh, we could not blur the faces, 
But just to give you the basic of it, um, there was a uh, reporter, an Arabic reporter, that went in to talk to the children of Al Hol, and she asked them, "Are you Syrian or Iraqi?" This is all in Arabic, and she said, and "The kids say no. We're Islamic State." And then they basically say, you know, you're not dressed appropriately, you're not wearing a veil, you know, we will kill you. And she's very surprised and she's like, but why would you kill me? You're a human, I'm a human, we're all humans. And the kids are saying, no, absolutely not, you're not appropriate, you have to behave like a woman is supposed to behave. And the reason that that's important is it's very, for me, very important that we get people, you know, the women and children especially, out of these camps. Uh, my research assistant, Christian Warpinski, and I had done, a, we did a two page briefing. And the reason that we do this is, I will tell you, policymakers tend to have a very short attention span. If you can put something in an infographic and you can put something in two pages, you have a winner. So, what happened is that um, we looked last summer about the situation in Al Hol and Al Roche. And we were keenly aware of how dangerous it was for children and started keeping track. In the dark blue, you see all the countries and you see the known repatriation. And in the light blue, we have what we actually think is still left. And, you know, in Canada, they've taken just back one. I think the United States has taken back 12. So what happens is we, we really need to understand the kinds of stressors and the kinds of uh, trauma that the children had been exposed to. On the second page of this two-page document, it's a pamphlet, uh, working with Heidi Ellis, who is my partner on the, on the research project, as well as Emmy, Emm, uh, Emma Cardelli, we have some solutions. You know, trauma systems therapy is providing a framework for how do you reintegrate and rehabilitate uh, children when they leave Islamic State, when they come back to countries. And then we have to understand the role of all of these you know, um, nested circles, what's going on in the family and in the school system and in society, and what are some of the threats, and then what are some of the reintegration responses and the challenges that we need to understand. The other thing, so again, um, I'm a little bit of an entrepreneurial person. I had this translated, the two pages you just saw, translated into Arabic. And so what happened was when we translated it to Arabic, it was disseminated through my my um, group of women civil society, society organizations called Wassel and ICANN, and this has been distributed throughout the Middle East and Pakistan and Africa. And of course, it was easier for many of these places to translate from the Arabic to their language than from, Eng <clears throat> than from English to their language. And it's also been included in part of the Ahlan Sumsum, um, I guess it's part of their uh, um, treatment plan because I sent it over to David Miliband from IRC and he now has uh, an approach to help the children. The last, I think I, I hear some clicking, so I guess I'm out of time. The gold standard for some of these de-radicalization programs, I spent a lot of time in Pakistan with these children in Sabaun. Sabaun means the first uh, rays of dawn's light and it's a fantastic program, but here's the difference. It's a Pakistan program in Pakistan for Pakistan youth. We know who's responsible for these children. What's happened with um, the children of ISIS, nobody wants to take responsibility. I'm going to stop here and I can circle back to this uh, notion of the nature versus nurture um, if it comes up in the Q&A because I want to make sure that I have enough time and I'm going to stop my share if I can and say thank you very much for your time. Yes, thanks a lot, uh, Mia. Um, I think we are still waiting for Elizabeth to join us. Uh, but in the meantime, you can all use the Q&A function to send in questions. Uh, you can find it uh, on the top of your screen and, uh, and uh, write your Q&As and then I will will um, uh, uh, read it out so that Mia can answer. Um, uh, Rike, is there any hope that we can get Elizabeth uh, in the speaking mode? We are working on it, closing in, but we'll see. Okay. Well, in the meantime, let me start start with asking one question um, to Mia. Um, what do you consider to be the greatest security risk to Western society 
to keep these children there or to bring them here? Absolutely bring them back. And I'll, and I'll tell you why. We worked with um, several experts on child trauma, as well as Tanya Zayed, who was an expert on child soldier rehabilitation and DDR programs. Uh, she worked with the Child Soldier Initiative for eight years. And she had gone all over the world, you know, helping child so former child soldiers reintegrate back into their society. This was the finding. For the very young children, and we have children, I mean, shockingly enough, you have a three-year-old, like um, the, the son of who was a well-known one of these so-called jihadi brides. She hands him a remote control and she says, push the button. And the three-year-old pushes the button and a car explodes and three people are killed. That child did not kill three people. That child pressed the button because mommy said press a button. With the very young children, as long as we remove the very, you know, pejorative influence from the child, that child has an opportunity for a very happy and wonderful life. And the reason that I showed at the last, one of the last slides was from Sabon in Pakistan. These were all children who had either been handed over by their parents or kidnapped by the Pakistani Taliban. And they were normal kids. Uh, they were playing cricket. I, I found out I'm a terrible cricket player, but I played cricket with them and we sat around and we talked and uh, they, they were asking me questions about California. And, you know, like they're normal kids. But just two years ago or a year ago, these were kids that were being trained to cut off a person's head or to be a suicide bomber. So that I think that we should never give up on the children. And certainly the very young children, it's absolutely not their choice or, or they had any responsibility for where they were born. If we bring them back, we absolutely have to do an assessment uh, for the adults to make sure that the child is not going to be exposed to some sort of ideology that ultimately is going to pull them back into some sort of militant activities. For the older children, I think the larger danger isn't so much of re-engaging, but the larger danger is that the skill sets that ISIS taught the children will be useful for criminal gangs and other kind of really bad influences, bad networks, so that they might get pulled in. And so one of the things that, you know, on the two page um, document that I did and with Heidi did uh, from our article that we published in uh, Childhood and Trauma was to understand we cannot stigmatize these children. These children are not at fault. You know, and, and um, there's a woman in America and her son, you know, she took all of her kids to Islamic State and she had a few kids also while she was there. And her son was in a video threatening Donald Trump. And now because of the podcast, I am not a monster, we can actually hear the kids say, you know, I, I did what I was told to do. I didn't like it. I'm so happy to be back with my grandparents in America and safe. And like, he's going to have a much better life. He's not radicalized, you know, and so I don't think a child can be radicalized. So he, where, where do I get controversial? At around the age of 16, based on all the research I've been doing for these 33 years, by 16, although technically still a child, people start to develop their own political identities. And because in many of these cultures, the 15 is a cutoff point for you know what they call adulthood or maturity. Um, in Arabic, it's called bulk. It's like, in other words, 15 is the age a boy can be responsible and be his mother's chaperone. 15 is the age that they see as the age of responsibility. So I think that when we're dealing with 16, 17, 18 year old kids, then we're in a different situation. But keep in mind now there's been a lag. So many of these kids who are 18 now we're still only 13 then, and we need to have age appropriate interventions, but absolutely take the kids back. Leaving them in Al Hol and Al Roj, we know leaving people in refugee camps is never a solution. It wasn't the solution for Palestine, and it wasn't the solution when Tutsis came back to Rwanda after having been expelled in 1975.
Yes, thank you. Uh, we are still waiting for Elizabeth. It doesn't seem like she is able to join us. So um, I have another question here. Um, um, let me see. Yeah, um, uh, which continues on on the on the issue. Could you say a bit more about the, the challenges of rehabilitating these children? Uh, if you sp speak of different age groups and, and their length of exposure and so on. Well, so what happens is that I'm going to close. Apparently, apparently my Skype is on, and I have to. Uh, it's my students need me. Um, okay. Some of the rehabilitation measures have to do with um, what Pakistan did. They got their children up to the age of uh, where they should be in their education. So it was a four-pronged approach. So let's say, for instance, the child has been with this movement for many years. You have to get them educated. They also did a lot of vocational training. And the vocational training was very important because you want them to have a skill set for afterwards so that they don't just get pulled back into the movement. The other thing was trauma therapy. So this is why we recommended trauma systems therapy and different kinds of approaches, psychological approaches with social workers and with therapists. And then finally, and this is not to be ignored, the children had to, in Pakistan, the children had to be re-educated in Islam because the version of Islam that they had was completely distorted. It was not an Islam that is the real Islam. So having access to, I mean, they had a sheikh come in to do Islam classes to basically say, I know what you thought you, you, you studied or you heard, it's all wrong. And it's very similar to the story that Mubin Sheikh tells that when he finally went to Syria and, you know, the Sheikh took him aside and said, you know, so what does the Quran say? And he goes, Surat al Tawbah 5, kill them, kill them wherever you find them. And, okay, who's the them? The Sheikh asks, who's the them? And he goes, oh, the them are the Mushrikeen. Okay, who are the Mushrikeen? The Mushrikeen are the Jews and the Christians. And that's when the Sheikh said, no, no. You're looking at Surat al Tawbah starting from five. Who starts a book at chapter five? Start from chapter one. What does Surat al Tawbah one say? Oh, the Mushrikeen are a tribe in the you know Arabian Peninsula that broke their promise and they they broke an agreement with the Prophet Muhammad. Okay, that's so. This is where having access and, and more information about Islam is is inoculating. It allows the person to say, that's not what the Quran or that's not what the, uh, the uh, Hadith say, that's not what the Sunnah says. Like it empowers the person to be able to fend off, to have the ballast to say, you are distorting the text. And I think it's one of the reasons why, not so much with the children, but why we see so many converts that become radicalized. Yes, of course, there is the Sunday morning or Monday morning quarterbacking, this expression that, you know, they watch the uh, they watch the game on Sunday and Monday now they're full of answers or that they're trying to overcompensate because they're not born into the faith. But I think there's also something to be said, if you don't speak the language and you need someone to be your interlocutor as you are dealing with these Islamic texts, rules and regulations, you are very heavily reliant on that person being honest and telling you the truth. And so this is where you know, it's a multi-pronged approach. Uh, unmute, Tura. Okay, okay. Uh, now I'm unmuted. Uh, we've got quite a lot of questions here, so more, more questions than we are able to cover, but start with this one. It has been reported that many former child soldiers, especially girls, are stigmatized by their families and societies when they try to reintegrate into society. Do you have any comments in this regard when it comes to how families and societies can be better prepared for when children return to um, in order to decrease stigmatization when they shall return? How will children manage to reintegrate if they are not accepted by their family or communities? Well, first of all, that's a fantastic question. Absolutely. I think that the stigma is also related to maybe what happened to the girls. In other words, that, uh, you know, something inappropriate happened as far as physical contacts, right? 
So this is where uh, we do absolutely, we have to address the stigma. So part of it is the stigma is particularly intense uh, in rural areas versus urban areas. So how do I know that I work as part of the Wassel group, the uh, the group that I sent the two page pamphlet in Arabic. I work very closely with Fatima Akilu and she runs these uh, de-radicalization programs for women and children in Nigeria. And what she has observed is that with Boko Haram, the children, if they are rescued or if they are brought back, you know, the bring back our girls, if it's a rural setting, it's less likely that the communities will accept them back. But in an urban setting, it's more likely. And in other words, that people can explain, obviously the girls, if they were kidnapped, they, they, were not, um, they, were, they were not giving their consent to being kidnapped. And we have to understand that the, you know, these things that have happened to them is a trauma and you don't re-traumatize the child. But as far as you're saying about the stigma, 100% right, one of the things to make this more successful is what you do is you, before you rehabilitate the child or repatriate the children, you go into that community and you make sure the community is willing to accept them because the last thing you want is to have the stigmatization re-traumatize and then leave them perhaps no options. And I'll give you a tangible example from my dissertation. There were, and again, this goes way before, Tori, that I even met you, when we had Kurdish, uh, during the Anfal campaign in 1987 in Iraq, where Saddam Hussein was targeting the Kurdish community and he was targeting them for all kinds of, you know, uh, gassing and genocide and, and all the different kinds of horrible war crimes that is not unexpected from Saddam Hussein. They had a division where they would sexually abuse the, the girls, the Kurdish girls, and the Kurdish families would not accept them. And having no possibility of marriage and no money, the girls had little choice but to become women who, by their profession, are, in, are sex workers. And by becoming the sex workers, it validated the stigma in the first place. So we cannot do that to all these children who are innocent and were brought by their parents or were born in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah, finally, Elizabeth has been able to join us. I don't know how much you were able to, to hear from, from uh, Mia's presentation, Elizabeth, but if you have any comments uh, or contribution, please go ahead. You have to unmute. Yeah. First of all, I just had to say sorry uh, for these technical issues. Um, well, we've been trying hard, so now I have another computer here, but I think it's something about the health department, where, which I'm a part of. It's uh, technical problems on, you know, in every organization here right now. So, first of all, I just want to say thank you to Mia. Uh, I've been in and out of your presentation trying to fix the technical problems, but I had the honor to listen to you uh, at the Helsinki conference. And uh, I also printed out your PowerPoints here, so <laughs> I've been looking through uh, your presentation and it's, it's really powerful and uh, mind blowing and strong presentation that I think it's uh, it puts a lot of um, uh, different fields in perspective because I think radicalization and extremism is also so linked to grooming that you have been talking about. Hopefully you mentioned that today as well, but you have mentioned that earlier. Because we normally we link grooming into human trafficking, at least here in Norway. Uh, and uh, I just also want to tell you that I've been listening to your podcast. So, so uh, about love bombing and about that connection that I'm talking about. Um, you are talking about radicalization and extremism of children within Taliban and, and ISIS, you know, and my work is uh, most of all outside that context in a Western context or a multicultural context. Uh, but I also been, um, you know, working with children at risk in different African countries and in the states who have been radicalized into gangs, especially in the states. And we've been working with uh, therapeutic reintegration back to society. And I see a lot of similarities of the same thing that we see working with de-radicalization of uh, children and youth uh, here in Norway. So I don't know. Uh, where to start if I'm going to talk briefly about this. I think it's hard to comment briefly because it's so much to comment on. Uh, but I think what you said about 
reintegration and, and stigma, shame and, and trauma is, is important to focus on because I think a lot of the children and youth who has been groomed by extremist groups through social media, that's the normal way it starts, especially in Norway. Um, you know, both girls and boys. And what I see, uh, you know, I work in a consultation team on radicalization and violent extremism, and I also counsel help services on this. Uh, what I see that many, in many of our cases, the boys, you know, are searching for a father figure that they easily get in radicalized groups as ISIS and Al Qaeda. They have very professional, caring, therapeutic services, you know, for that kind of boys that is also measured into a Western context and also Arabic context. Uh, I see the same, uh, you know, among girls, I see the father figure aspect, but also as a push factor, uh, but also the boyfriend, husband, the future husband, you know, the prince and the caliphate aspect. And a lot of the kids that we work with in our consultation team uh, and we're put on mentors, you know, because we educate mentors, we have around 40, 50 here in Bergen in a mentor pool. And um, they have, you know, complex or childhood trauma uh, issues that is untreated, internalized, you know, victimhood and uh, and also a lot of shame. Uh, so I think that, you know, that grooming aspect has been a part of that, you know, self therapy. You know, it, it's uh, it's, uh, you know, easing up the pain, you know, and uh, instead of, you know, it, it could be suicide or it could be different damaging, you know, the eating disorders is a, as a way of controlling your trauma. But this has also be, uh, been a, you know, self therapeutic way to handle the pain for a long time. So, um, of course, when we put on measures uh, in each case, we do an individual assessment. Uh, and also you, you talked about the age uh, aspect, which is really, really important in, into an individual assessment. How old is the child and uh, what have the child experienced? Uh, where are you along the radicalization path? You know, uh, what kind of network do you have around you? Uh, do you have parents at all or are you an orphan? You know, I also work with unaccompanied minors, especially from Afghanistan and Syria and Iraq. And there is a lot of similar aspect to the child soldier aspect that you mentioned. And many of them have already been kidnapped to Taliban because before they got or came, came to Norway. And that is something that is unknown for a lot of people. And we don't talk about it. It's kind of a family or individual secret. Um, so a lot of the same you know, risk factors or vulnerable factors that you mentioned within extremist uh, organization is also risk factors uh, for, you know, uh, refugees that we work with here in Norway. I'm not saying all, but there's a lot of secrets because it's so shameful to talk about it. So my, my experience is that it takes years before that comes up to the surface in the therapy, uh, in therapy sessions or in the school system, because families have parts and pieces, you know, they have different family stories. You come to Norway, you are reintegration within your own family system because maybe the dad has been in a war, maybe the mom has died, and you have, you know, one case I work with, one child has been kidnapped to ISIS and they came to Norway and they tried to live a normal life to get to know each other again in a new context, to grieve together, to find, to get to know each other again after many years of trauma. And then, you know, in the midst of it all, there is, there is uh, stories of family secrets. And what do you do with those family secrets? Uh, and I think that is uh, kind of an unusual aspect, and I haven't, maybe I haven't discussed this with Tuda before, but there is a lot of connections, you know, uh, I see that is not maybe the usual way of thinking about radicalization in Norway. Uh, and now I talk about Islamist, you know, the extremism in an Islamic context and not right wing extremism. Um, so I'm not saying that all the refugees have that kind of heavy stories that it exists and we also treat those cases in our consultation team and you know with de-radicalization tools. Yeah. 
But I, you know, uh, the trauma aspect is also, I think that's the most important thing when we do our individual risk assessment, that we have the life story aspects of each child or youth that we work on. And then we have to consider what kind of, is it disengagement or is it a de-radicalization uh, as or, or uh, approach that we're going to have here? In most of the cases, we need to start with disengagement because, you know, we can't start with ideological de-radicalization, you know, and, and start kind of picking up theology before we have stabilized uh, their life enough to come into position to talk about ideology. Uh, ideology. And I also think that that is a part of trauma stabilization to do disengagement measures, you know, to have safety around you, to build up trust, you know, to restore trust, to restore a safety network, and also to find, you know, people that cares for you, that you really genuinely believe that somebody is caring for you. You know, one thing is to find a mentor or a teacher that is kind, but it takes maybe half a year or two years to experience the trust. So, so this is, a, you know, we have to have a long term aspect when we do interventions with people who are being really complex traumatized and also maybe they had you know been kidnapped or been having really you know um yeah different roles in the caliphate or in the war that is extreme you know so it's a lot of uh i, I mean we, it's complex and you need to assess it with a multidisciplinary competence and that is so important that it's not just one person but it's a competent team you know around that person I wanted to add something that I thought you would find very interesting. So because I work, so I have someone exactly like you, um, Heidi Ellis, who I work with. She's the head of the Refugee Trauma Center at Boston Children's Hospital, and she's professor at Harvard. So she's been my partner on this project. And she also is the partner on the trauma systems therapy approach and understanding sort of Brof and Brenner's um, nested sort of a social ecology in which the children operate. One of the things that we did, and, and this is an answer, I should have answered this to Tori before, but I'm so glad that you're here to hear the answer. We did a study. Now we did not have many, but Heidi has been tracking for over 10 years, a Somali refugee community. So for 10 years, the same group of people. And what happened was we had within the Somali refugee community, a handful, maybe 20 or so, children who had been in El Shabaab. Now they're adults now, so she's tracking them. And here was the most surprising thing. As the refugees were, um, well, integrated into the United States because they were not repatriated back to Somalia, the children who had been in El Shabaab did better in school. They did better in life. They, they had a resilience that that's the only explanation because we're not going to say that these experiences could ever be good what we're saying is that the negative sequelae on the children does not mean that it is a life sentence of guaranteed negative sequelae like it's not guaranteed that the child is going to forever suffer and that they were able to really excel when they came to the united states and i'm saying that in part because when i argue to governments and to prosecutors and to different places, please take back the women and children. I use these examples of having a fantastic, not just an okay outcome, I'm saying disproportionately better than average outcome. And so we always need to give the children a chance. But the mul you know, so there's a hopeful, you know, end to the story, but we definitely have to have a multi pronged approach. I don't know if it has to be scaffolded like you're talking about in Pakistan it's sort of all at the same time but also it's a you know 297 kids and so you know they they have what's working for them there is a question here which uh, fits well very well to this topic um from Linnea do you reckon there is a danger of arguing for repatriation from a securitization perspective or uh, uh, we uh, like we should repatriate the children, help them so that they do not become a threat to us in the future. Versus, we should repatriate them because they are innocent children who should be safe. 
Thank you, Linnea. No, my, my first is always going to be we should repatriate the children because they're children. And that, you know, every child deserves a chance. You can make an argument. I mean, sometimes you have to make a securitized argument in order to convince people who politically are opposed to it. I know Erika and I were talking about what happened last year in Norway when you, you know, when there was a repatriation of uh, two women and their children and it almost caused the government to collapse. So sometimes, and, and this might sound very instrumentalist of me, sometimes depending on who I'm speaking to, if I am talking to, you know, police officers or I'm talking to people whose knee jerk reaction is to say, no, not our problem, let them stay in those countries. I might include the securitization argument to say, well, you know, it's good to get them back so that they don't become a possible threat. The problem is that um, it was a conversation I used to have years ago when I would debate Alan Dershowitz about torture. He thought there was something called torture light. And, uh, you know, and I had to sort of say, no, torture, <laughs> torture is very bad. And I would say to people whose instinct was to say, well, you know, like maybe just a little. And I was like, okay, you know what? It's wrong. But me telling you it's wrong isn't going to resonate. You're not, you're just going to shut down and not listen. And you're going, oh, some liberal left wing, you know, Democrat is telling me torture is wrong. I would say it doesn't work. And here's why it doesn't work. So sometimes the way we are convincing countries to take the children back, we may have to use language that isn't necessarily the language in our hearts, but is the language that is most effective because the goal is to get the kids back. And I'm at a point where if I need to speak in securitized language in order to convince people to let children back, I will use that language. But honestly, to you, absolutely. It's because the children are innocent and they deserve a chance. We should not be stealing their futures because their parents maybe made a mistake. Please, uh, you want to follow up, Elizabeth? You have to unmute. Yes. Well, it might look like I wanted to follow up because this engaged me as well, and I totally agree with Mia's approach on this one. And also we have, I mean, a responsibility to follow the ar articles of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And that is also something that we, I'm sitting in a national expert group, and we wrote a strategy document to the government before we picked out or went to Al Hol and, and got the last w uh, mother with a sick child uh, last year. And I think it's important, you know, that the child's need is in a major focus. This, this is our children. This is our children on a universal level, but also on a national level. And I know Russia is now, you know, picking up, picking up also children without mothers right now. And I think that should, you know, we should encourage our government to do the same. But I'm not going to go into politics here, uh, but I think that this, you know, we need to see the child's rights aspect uh, and, and not put this into a political case. And I know that that kind of, you know, it, it, this deals with lines of conflict in Norwegian politics, the whole discussion. Um, but I, I agree that this is this is about human rights and the children's rights, and that should be the major aspect. And also in, in the treatment aspect, you know, we, we can argue with securitization, but also I think they have the right to to uh, be treated and uh, in terms of children's rights and also they need therapy and they need a normal life to get healed. And that's our responsibility. If this was ethnical Norwegian children, you know, uh, it would be different, I think. Yes, um, uh, just follow up with some of the questions we have uh, received here. Uh, one uh, is bringing up the issue of to what extent can a child be so brainwashed that we cannot help them? Is that uh, what you think about that, uh, Mia and Lisbeth? What, to what extent the child could be so brainwashed that we can't help the child? Yeah. I don't think, uh, you know, to me, I think I don't think that never will happen that the children is so brainwashed. I never heard a story that there is no hope. We need to hold on to the hope in those cases and a child can adopt to <laughs> to new lifestyles. We just need to have the right time aspect. We need to do it professionally and normalize the environment of the child to normalize the caregivers, you know, to restore uh, integrity, autonomy, value 
you know, and, and, and to give them a, a normal childhood. I've seen a lot of cases of children who's been a part of, who's been ch child soldiers in Congo, in, in many African countries, you know, we received quite a number of those refugees a few years back in Norway, I think it was in the 90s. Uh, but we also, uh, like I mentioned, we have many unaccompanied minors who have been indoctrinated, many have been kidnapped and they've been sexual abused. We have, yeah, a lot of those risk factors. But indoctrination, that is very, you know, to me, um, what do you say, in, um, well, well, it will always be some human aspect of a child that is left in spite of the child being indoctrinated. And in that human aspect of a trial, there is room for healing. I don't believe, I don't believe, I, exactly, I'm going to be, unfortunately, it's not interesting if we don't disagree, but I agree. <laughs> First of all, I think, okay, so I use the term brainwashing, I'm going to put it in quotes, because I don't actually believe, from a psychological perspective, I'm not a psychologist, but I don't think that there's actually brainwashing in the DSM five or six. Like, I don't think that it is an actual, I think it's something that, you know, like, for example, Stockholm syndrome, like there is, there are psychological manifestations of this. I don't know about the brainwashing. And this is one of the reasons why and I'm, I'm so happy Elizabeth, you brought up the love bombing. We do know that people are seeking validation and that we know that if the validation is coming from a negative source, they're going to be drawn to that negative source. We know, for example, among the children that participated in these ISIS cubs, not all of them were necessarily radicalized. They might have been there because their families were threatened. They might have been there because, uh, like, as a girl, as you can imagine, as a quote-unquote ISIS bride, which also I don't love this term, but you're now going to be the sole breadwinner of the family. This is something that the, the like a 15 year old girl is now going to be able to take care of her siblings and her parents. And in some way, she feels this responsibility and it becomes a source of pride that because she married a foreign fighter, her family is going to get all these benefits. So it's not coercion in the sense that, you know, at gunpoint, you're going to marry this Mujahid, you're going to marry this guy. There were so many different things entering into the calculation that when children were given the option either to join or not join, but we also know that most of the times they were not given the choice. When you give your child over to a militant organization, and you know what I saw in Pakistan, and we even saw it in ISIS, where the parents knew that the kid was going to die. The, the, the parent is saying goodbye to the child as they get into the car bomb. I find this unnatural. Like I find this, you know, we always hear stories about how a parent, like a the woman has superhuman strength to save the child from the burning car. Like this is a trope that we have like this maternal paternal parental instinct is so strong that I don't understand when it's not kicking in. But as far as anyone ever being too far gone, I don't think anyone is ever too far gone. I think that we should take even the possibility that like that's never the most horrible person still has a chance to recant rehabilitate and this is not to forget what they did or even forgive what they did but certainly to move on to something where maybe they can take these negative experiences and turn them to something positive so like you know i this is where for example we've been talking about off topic the QAnon where, you know, I don't believe this is it's a radicalization problem. I think it's a mental health crisis. But, you know, so we're getting into, Sophia and I, and she is a psychologist, are getting into this space where it financially benefits me to say it's radicalization and terrorism, and I'm saying it's not. So if I have every incentive to exaggerate the threat and lie to you, I'm telling you, it's not. So I think everyone deserves the chance for a happy, and successful life, especially children. Absolutely, and I just have a comment to that because I think a lot of people are mixing also indoctrination and complex trauma. Because complex, if you're complex traumatized and violent extremism becomes a way to deal with the complex uh, traumatization, 
uh, you know, you see the world as dangerous. You see the world as a threat. You, see, you know, you prepare yourself for fleeing, flighting, and 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 also that kind of affects the attitude you have to yourself in others. And I think you know, negative feelings such as fear and helplessness and an anger that is dominating your daily life. If you are complex, traumatized, and also has gotten into violent extremism, and the mind is preparing for conflict constantly. And I think also the traumatized mind that also fit into this black and white thinking and the polarized conception um, of the will and, and uh, the enemy, you know, you're uh, separating between the friend and enemy, good and bad and black and white and all this. I'm sure you talked about it uh, when I was fixing my computer. <laughs> I think that that is what we associate with indoctrination and brainwashing, you know, because you are such an easy uh, uh, victim or terrorist organization. Your brain is always it's ready to go into that kind of path, you know, so they can shape you and that it's, it doesn't take a long time before you are, you know, a soldier, a very good soldier and, and you can live and die for the concept. But I think what we know about complex trauma is that as long as we provide uh, trauma sensitive care, you know, and provide a good enough childhood, you know, with trauma informed approach, giving the children the basic needs and restore that foundation that has been stolen from them. There is so much hope in that process, you know, I, I and, and that we should, you know, give up hope because we think that the children is too or not receive the children because they're too dangerous for a society. They're taking bombs. That's a totally, totally misunderstood narrative and 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 uh, a hopeless way to look at a child. So I think we need to go, you know, look at the ethical aspect of humans as well in this dialogue. And it's funny you mentioned the ticking bombs. It was something that I reacted uh, on Twitter very negatively because it was one weekend where the Times of London and the New York Times and a bunch of and Washington Post all had this, you know, the children were ticking bombs and I, I, I fight against this. I fight against uh, baby bombers. I fight against the terminology that we use. Like, and, and sometimes you write something and especially not as an academic and the editors change the title of the, and you're thinking, oh my God, no, that's the opposite of what I want to say. So I think it's very important that we make clear that, you know, these children have had different kinds of experiences and what I led with before you were able to join I said there's three kinds of experiences it's what the, the trauma from what the children were forced to see we know the children were surrounded by beheadings and heads on pikes they were forced to watch these horrible acts they were sometimes participating in acts either handing out the knife or like I showed you with the five children doing the execution themselves and then we know that the children were also you know, in some cases sexually abused. One of the things that the Taliban, the Pakistani Taliban did before sending off, and these were all boys in their group that they were using, there were no girls. Before sending the boy off, they would sexually abuse the boy. And they would do that so he had no way out because there was no going home from that. And so we have to understand that the layers of trauma, even for the children who are engaged in what we consider to be the most horrific acts, have themselves multiple complex trauma. Absolutely. And I think also when you do a risk assessment uh, of, you know, in terms of reintegration, uh, you have to look at the age, you know, what were they born in the caliphate or did they integrate into the caliphate? And, and that also has to do with, you know, the child, the, the child brain. Did they have a normal childhood? That is resilience. If they had a normal childhood for a few years, maybe for the first seven years, uh, at the same time, uh, it can be also a weakness because you actually have two worldviews and you have two different contexts that you have to to uh, yeah, be a part of and, and try to find yourself in. So they can be confusing as well. But that is something that we look at uh, when we look at reintegration of children of foreign fighters or moms who has been in the caliphate, you know, and also a risk factor is the multiple parenthoods you know, and, and they have lost and, and how many losses have they had in terms of losing a caregiver? Many have had maybe six dads and, and, and more, more so. And many have also babies have been left to themselves without any caregivers when the bombing has happened. 
you know, so you know when a baby, an innocent baby who is five months old and the bomb is happening or a war scene outside and there's nobody there to secure you, to physical calm you down, you know that the brain is also going to develop into an alarm and risk uh, uh, context. So I think there's a lot of different varieties that we need to look at when we do assessment and reintegration. But what we say when we counsel, because I'm sitting in a national team also counseling, you know, the family system around those children we have reintegrated back to Norway, and we also collaborate with different countries in the Nordic countries, you know, exchanging experiences. You know, what we say to the system that is a part of the, you know, therapeutic social system around the families and children is that, you know, 95% uh, of what you do is what you do normally with other families who has experienced complex trauma uh, and a broken childhood. But the, it's this remaining five percentages that can be, um, yeah, diff difficult for the system because you have, I think the worst thing is that you have those picture, pictures from the caliphate, the helpers, you know, you're kind of, you really don't know, you know, you're seeing the pictures and the images from social media. Uh, you might, you really don't know, have, have the children experience of being a, being a part of shooting or being a part of having a significant role. That, those kind of things. So the alienation you have within you as a helper that can pass on to the children and the fear you have. You know, so it's stigma of, and also in France when we talk about with collaboration partners that is part of the therapeutic uh, reintegration program uh, in the main hospital in Paris, they say the same. It's, it's the fear and the shame and the stigma that, you know, that is passed on from the helpers to the children. That is the worst aspect of the reintegration. So, so we really need to work with sensitization of the helpers and their fear, their images. It might not, uh, it's the right images to have, you know, and it's kind of criminalizing the children they work with. And another aspect, I'm, not, I'm gonna stop now, Tura, you know, uh, <laughs> is that the children, when we talk with collaboration partners in France who have much more experiences than Norway, we have seven children, you know, when we talk directly about the caliphate belonging. Uh, you know, they don't have a language and you separate the parents from the children at the airport. You know, parents have a very strong, strict system on this one or friends. Uh, and, and the children is, you know, the worst, the separation anxiety, that is kind of the worst trauma. It's not necessarily the war trauma they carry, but it's the separation that happened because you need a continuous aspect in healing. And especially if you don't have a language as a small child who is two, three years old. So, so, um, so, so they work a lot with, you know, uh, sensory motoric psychotherapy. They work with uh, art therapy, music therapy, because you can't really use the same cognitive approaches that you do normal, you know, with a child without a language. So, uh, so there's many aspects to reintegration, and there is. Uh, it's also age has a has a lot to do with what kind of measures you put in. We have uh, still a dozen questions, uh, so it's uh, I, I would try to pick up some of them. And one, two questions here are relevant to the present discussion. One said, uh, I do understand that children in terrorist organizations deserve a chance to a better life, but why bring back the grown up women, their mums? And the other one says, do you have any advice for the correction service on how to work with returnees, mothers with the children, when the mum is incarcerated? That's a tough, <laughs> that's a tough question. Um, okay, so I think that, you know, we've just touched upon the fact that Elizabeth, that if you cannot, we know from America separating children at the border with their parents, it does not produce a very good result. We are going to be traumatizing children in a whole new way. Part of it is, we don't know what motivated the mothers to go in the first place. And I'll tell you an anecdote. Uh, in 2015, I was at Thames House. And if you can Google what Thames House is, you know what that is. I'm not going to say it on the video that's going to be on YouTube. And I was uh, talking about, not children yet, but I was talking about the women. And I was hearing about all these women who had disappeared from the UK with their with their children and left the husband. And and this is something I joked with Reke yesterday. yesterday. 
Um, I said, you know, that sounds strange, but I wonder, check to see the hospital records of these women or if the crisis, you know, the 800 number or whatever the, the number is in the UK, the rape crisis center, the domestic violence center, if there's any activity from these women. And they said, what's the connection? And I said, well, you know, these are mostly, they call it Asian, we would say South Asian. These were mostly Asian women. And I said, in, the, in that community, the marriages are arranged. And leaving your husband because he beats you is not an excuse you can give. It's not something that your parents will accept. But leaving your husband to join your cousin in the Islamic State, while it's not a good thing, it's a completely different narrative that doesn't bring shame to your family. I mean, it's, it's going to bring interrogation by the police. It's other problems. But it's not something that the community would look down on a woman like, yeah, okay, so he beat her. But you know, like, in other words, we don't know if women left and went to the Islamic State for whatever reason. But also many of these women might actually still be girls. We know from the family when they, there was a long campaign to rehabilitate the Sharuf children, the one that was holding the head, to Australia, that by the time they were being rehabilitated, the 15-year-old already had two children. So these are not adult women necessarily. They might have been young children brought to the caliphate with their families. They didn't have a vote. And so that's one reason why accept the women back. I don't think all the women who joined Islamic State are equally radicalized. Yes, there were absolutely some women who went and they said, I want to I want to kill, I want to shoot, I want to behead. OK, by the way, they didn't get to do any of those things for the most part. For the most part, women were treated like a commodity to be traded in the Islamic State. But that's they, they sort of let them think. When they were coming, oh yeah, sure, you're going to be on patrol. You're going to be part of this Al Khansa brigade. The other thing to consider is that um, people very often, you know, Tory knows better than anyone leaving terrorism behind. People leave movements, and we have to, if they want to leave, we have to give them a place to go. They need an exit strategy. And if the women may have been all in with the Islamic State, they have doubts now. We have to give them the chance to get out and, again, um, give them those opportunities, both to pay their debt to society if they're going to jail or treatment. We know from studies that have been done at the George Washington Program on Extremism that I think something like only one in four of the women are actually on trial. So that the women tend to be imprisoned at a lower rate because, you know, again, the assumption is that they weren't really doing the same kinds of things. They were endangering their children and they were probably participating in trafficking of Yazidis, but they weren't doing the other things that the men were mostly doing. Now, what to do with the, with the women and children, which is, that's a thorny issue. And this is true even when any mother is sent to jail for, you know, a criminal act or drugs or whatever she's done and found guilty. It is very traumatizing on the child, but hopefully there's grandparents or uh, cousins or aunts or uncles, someone within the family who can step in and take over the role as caregiver. Presumably if the woman is in jail, she's not going to be in jail for a lifetime sentence. It might be four or five years of jail and presumably also every country allows visitors. So I would say that you, if, if a woman has done bad enough acts that merit her going to jail in whatever country she's in, then she should go to jail and the children have to be taken care of. But you don't completely cut the families from the child. You you don't want to traumatize, like you don't want to add another layer of trauma of like being abandoned. Yeah. Uh, any comments to that, uh, Lisbeth? Um... On, well, on with, the, with the mothers. Yeah, uh, well, you know, the mother children relationship as well is really important because I think a lot of like uh, Mia is saying, yeah, they have played different roles. And but that is also uh, the difficulty here to assess what roles have you played, because there's a lot of threats from ISIS still and, and secrets that, you know, uh, secrets within yeah, the environment. And, and we saw that in, in France as well. In dialogue with them when we made our strategy in Norway, we had a collaboration there and and they said that what is really 
making delaying the treatment and the healing process of the children and the moms is that secrets within the caliphate, you know, that I have promised, you know, not to leak. So, so you know, and that can also be associated to, to roles. But here in Norway, uh, I think we have uh, at least we don't have that many, and uh, there are many in Al Hol still, and we have quite a small number, and we have an overview. We, we think we do, you know, of, of the roles in the caliphates. And, and also we have to think that a lot of those moms have been good caregivers for the children. And the children needs, the most important in the healing process is a continuous aspect, you know, in the future. We need to build bridges between past and future and, and, uh, and present. And I think that it's important when they are sent, in, you know, in, you know, in the process in, in the court or are in prison, that we have a good collaboration with the prison care and that the children get to see the mom regularly in those cases where the moms are not depressed or very depressed or, you know, struggling too much with mental disorders. I think that is a really important aspect. And in Norway, we have a good system for, for that right now. And, uh, and that is important to follow up because we see a lot of countries haven't succeeded in that. They have separated them saying, no, we can't use extended family. We need just foster families because they don't trust the family system at large. And I think that's discrimination because how can you say that it's always transgenerational extremism past three generations? You know, in Norway, we have a good collaboration with the biological family, the same in Holland, in Belgium, at least. Um, and I think in Holland has the best strategy so far that I have seen in that process. I'm sorry, Tora, I can't hear you. <laughs> sorry, Tora, I, I, I don't, I, you have to unmute yourself again. <laughs> again, OK. OK, we are getting close to the end. Um, we have still have quite a lot of questions here, but um, I think we should uh, stop because we would then have to change the topic. So if you have a final statement, Mia and, and Lisbeth, uh, you can have that and then we, we uh, thank you for your contributions. So the final statement that I would make is that, again, uh, Elizabeth and I are agreeing so much my, I apologize if it was less interesting that we weren't disagreeing. That's usually for better TV, at least. Uh, that we have to have great empathy as we approach the children. We have to have great empathy for people who, if you consider the, the layers of trauma, that in other words, people who went to the Islamic State saw and did horrible things. And there's a trauma. We don't know exactly why many of them went. Uh, there's very complicated reasons why they joined Islamic State. And so shunning them or leaving them to waste somewhere in a foreign country is never going to be a solution because if you are worried, going back to that securitization question that Annika asked before, it's never a solution to leave people in a refugee camp or IDP camp, and especially during a global pandemic, and especially, you know, like, it's only going to get worse and it's going to get worse for them, not just because they may stay radicalized or become more radicalized or re-engage, but just because as human beings, we have to have empathy because they're human and they did, they did a very bad thing, but they're still human beings. Yeah, I think that I think it's a you know human global uh, responsibility to restore. Uh, you know, if you're going to do trauma healing, we need to do it at large as a not just as a profession, but it's a as a, a collective society uh, as humanitarians. You know, and and that's uh, within our inner core as humans. I think it's an ethical responsibility that we need to take in every profession, but also as a society. Yeah, with these uh, wise words, I think we are at the end of our session. So I will thank uh, Mia and, and Elizabeth a lot uh, for your contributions and Rikke for uh, helping to organize this event. 
So we will have more consortium seminars uh, during the, later this spring. Uh, we haven't all the plans ready yet, but uh, there will be more to come. So thank you to all of you. Bye bye. Thank you.